It's police car. Oh, excuse me. This is uh, this is motorcade from Brentwood. Approximately 20 minutes ago, when he was first taken into custody, this after leading police on a 60-mile uh, chase through Orange County and Los Angeles County up to his Brentwood, uh, California mansion. Our coverage continues uh, on the O.J. Simpson arrest. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And then he went on to say that uh, he'd had a very good relationship with his ex-wife. But then he went on to say that he was sometimes felt like a battered husband. Mm -hmm. So that the whole suicide note, uh, or the whole note, in our view, would be a self-destructive or suicidal yes. note, plus the fact that he did uh, change his will or added a codicil. That typically goes along with someone who feels that the end of their lives are near. Now, uh, the, the, the mention was made about by the, his fellow athlete and by other people about the carnival atmosphere out there. Dr. Uh, Messer, uh, yes. Dr. Messer, I'd like this, to bring in Jim Moray from our yes, Los Jim. Angeles studio. Thank you, Lyndon. I just wanted to first bring you up to date that a news conference is indeed scheduled any minute at Parker Center. That's where O.J. Simpson is in custody right now. But let me ask Dr. Messer something from a viewer standpoint, something that struck me as unusual. We've been hearing that O.J. Simpson has been under the care of two doctors. He's been heavily medicated and sedated, and based on today's uh, apparent behavior, he seems to be out of control to some extent. And yet we saw him just uh, Thursday at the funeral. How do you... How do you weigh these two things? How do you explain this behavior? Well, this is uh, what we call or a dissociative state or dissociative behavior that is a funeral. The intensity of that and the emotion of that organizes him and he goes on automatic pilot and, be and he behaves as someone should when a funeral is coming up. After that is all over, he goes back to his intense grief and then you saw what happened this, uh, this very day. Could this build a foundation for a plea of insanity? Uh, Yes, I think that uh, and his lawyer very carefully is getting ready for that, I suspect. What's you the know, likely effect? Let, of, let me I'm say sorry. one thing, and that is I'm a doctor, and I want to tell you that I and you and anyone who's been watching this are exhausted because mm. adrenaline is an exhausting uh, chemical. And tomorrow, all of us ought to sleep comfortably and do some light exercise and really recuperate from this intense emotional experience. Sure. What is the likely effect of all of this on O.J. Simpson's two young children? Well, it's difficult because uh, these children now have lost their mother. And here their father is accused of a terrible crime. But he's still their father. And whether he goes to jail or how he goes to jail and so forth, in my view, in, in, in patients I see, that he has to show them that he still cares for them. He may have problems, he may have difficulties, but he has to still be a father and he has to be in their lives. We have seen instances of, of so-called domestic violence play out many times over the years. As reporters, we've, we've covered it too many times to mention where men are so ready to take out all of the people they love with them um, because, again, of that dissociative state that, that you've right. been mentioning. What propels people to, to such extremes? We, we uh, I suspect in marriage, when we marry, we place on our spouses intense and extraordinary expectations that we can speculate here with a person who's brought up at, as disadvantaged as this man was, that uh, all of his needs were not met. Uh, growing up and despite all that he persevered and persevered and persevered and he came to this heroic state now he has fallen as we've heard uh, so he invests in another person he invests too. in another person that, dr messer this yes. is jim moray in los angeles you talk about the extreme emotional state yes. which oj simpson exhibited today yes is it possible based on your uh, professional experience that this extreme emotional state occurred some time ago leading up to these events Absolutely. My theory is that uh, what happened is he felt uh, over these last month, weeks or months that his ex-wife was abandoning him. The story that we get here is that the, he was attempting a reconciliation. And when people feel abandoned or rejected, they can go into a tailspin. So is, is his behavior somewhat expected based yes. on what you've seen in the last few yes, years? Yes, what we call it, sometimes we call it separation homicide. If I invest so much emotion and feeling in a spouse and then he or she as the case may be rejects me 
then it wakes up all the feelings of pain and grief and abandonment. And sometimes this goes into homicide. I mentioned to Larry King earlier, very quickly, the story at the Naval, or with the Naval officer's last uh, Army-Navy game, where a couple were engaged. The woman then uh, uh, insisted they break off the engagement. The man, the, the ex-fiancé came to see her, begged her to reconcile. He refused, uh, she refused, and he left. And then she called a friend, another officer, to come by, a man, to talk with her. Now, this first man, the rejected man, came by. He saw the two of them, and he shot them both, and then he turned the gun on himself. I suspect this is per perhaps what we were seeing here today, in which uh, O.J. was uh, 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 saying that he's not worth living because of all the pain and trauma that he suffered, which then some of it he projected onto others, and now he became very self-destructive. And really the ending that we all waited for uh, was very good because he was within a hair's breadth, I think, of doing significant damage to himself and to others. Thank you, Dr. Messer. On that note, let's go now to Parker Center, where I'm told we have videotape of O.J. Simpson's arrival there. He is, of course, in custody, under arrest. He's going to be booked uh, for two counts of first-degree murder, with special circumstances. Again, in California, if convicted, that would carry only two possibilities for sentencing. One, life in prison without parole, and two, the death penalty. CNN's coverage of the O.J. Simpson arrest will, of course, continue. Please stay with us after this. Three of us at this moment fully realize what it is to watch O.J. Simpson run for 2,000 yards in one season. Now, the O.J. The NFL did not have a, a lot of personality when O.J. came along, and he was to the NFL what Michael Jordan was to the NBA. The California golden boy, he carried the Olympic torch in 84, had in fact grown up in a pretty tough San Francisco neighborhood. He was a gang kid in San Francisco with a reputation for being the toughest dude in the neighborhood and who would whack a woman as well as a man. After he retired in 1979, the Hall of Fame was waiting. I want to say to uh, the Hall of Fame members here, I mean, you don't know what this is, you know, to walk around here. I, you, you wonder, do you belong with this group of guys? Well, I must have done something good or something right to be here, and I just want you to know that I'll never let you guys down. Take it from O.J. Simpson. The charismatic O.J. kept rushing onto new careers. Go, O.J., go! In rent-a-car commercials. In the movies. No, no, you stay where you are, I'll get them down. Like Towering Inferno and the Naked Gun series. <laughs> and in broadcasting. Well, Al, down here, the field appears to be in excellent shape. O.J. Simpson, the athlete, always understood the playing field. On the gridiron, his instincts were... Simpson tried to get out of his car and run. This person would be in a best position to uh, either tackle him, take him down, or take a shot at him. It uh, fortunately, though, ended peacefully. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, a, a reminder to our viewers, Calling All Sports is up at the top of the hour. However, also due within the next few minutes, so we are expecting a live news conference from Parker Center. Classic taste. Buick and your better Buick dealers. The new symbol for quality in America. Builders Square. For all of your home improvement needs, we'll get you squared away. Aflac. Insuring over 38 million people worldwide. Your local 76 dealers who invite you to go with the spirit, the spirit of 76. And by Southwest Airlines. Fly Southwest Airlines. It's just plain smart. To soothe. Formally booked in. Pointing out John Blackstone as uh, O.J. Simpson's attorney did earlier in the evening. His being booked in, his being formally charged, does not mean that he is guilty of anything. It is the American system to emphasize that he stands right now as an accused citizen. It is up to the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he did what he is accused of doing, which is murdering his former wife and uh, her male friend. John, going on down the list of evidence that the police have talked about, now, there was talk of a bloodstained glove being found in O.J. Simpson's home, and then another bloodstained glove. Did the police confirm that two bloodstained gloves had been found in connection with the case? We don't have that confirmation yet. We do have the one bloodstained glove. We know that because, in fact, uh, cameras uh, saw that glove being found at the murder scene. 
Uh, that's the first uh, bloodstained glove. The, the reports, unconfirmed, but uh, among the many leaks from the police department in the course of this investigation, was that a matching glove was found at the, at the residence. Uh, much of the talk around here has been, wh why were there so many leaks from the police department? Police headquarters here in Southern California. Uh, he was seen in the back seat of one of the police vehicles as he came in. There's no indication uh, from the video uh, how he was feeling at the time, but he had been severely depressed all day. Uh, his uh, lawyer had said that Mr. Simpson was indeed suicidal, and the uh, conversations that Mr. Simpson apparently had over a cellular telephone on his, uh, on his odyssey during the day indicated that he was uh, indeed having a tremendous amount of emotional difference. What they have to say. Yes, it is. Okay, how's that? Okay, what I'm going to try to do here is uh, take my time and, and patiently explain uh, some of the events that unfolded this afternoon, talk a little bit about uh, uh, what's transpiring now, talk a little bit about what occurred at the arrest scene, uh, perhaps go into a little bit of detail, and uh, then we'll take some questions at the end. First, as you all know, uh, O.J. Simpson is in custody. He's been transported here to Parker Center. He is being booked and processed. That'll include uh, prints, mugshot, uh, those kinds of activities will occur here at Parker Center. He will then be transported to the main central jail, L.A. County main central jail. Uh, and we're very grateful to Sheriff Sherman Block for allowing us to do that. Uh, it'll make it certainly uh, much easier on us uh, here at the LAPD and the way we manage our jail facility. Uh, also, uh, uh, A.C. Uh, uh, Cowling uh, was... Uh, is being booked for 32 PC, uh, felony, $250,000 bail. Uh, he is being processed here at Parker Center. Uh, he will also be transported to the main central jail, LA County main central jail. And again, we thank Sheriff Block for that. Let me touch uh, briefly on some events that occurred uh, after our news conference where we discussed the fact that Mr. Simpson had failed uh, to appear. Obviously, the department uh, sent out an all-points bulletin. We notified not only all of the Los Angeles Police Department officers on duty through radio transmissions and teletypes. We certainly notified all of our specialized divisions. We also notified uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, the California Highway Patrol, all of the local and regional law enforcement agencies. We also immediately contacted the Orange County Sheriff's Department. Uh, we're very concerned uh, with the possibility that Mr. Simpson uh, would respond to the residence of, uh, of uh, one of the victims. Uh, we also were very concerned about uh, the welfare uh, of the children. Uh, so we tried to take whatever actions we could uh, with the other agencies to provide for the, the safety of anyone that possibly uh, could have been involved uh, in the situation. It also um, resulted in the deployment of police resources from other agencies, uh, very responsive, very cooperative, uh, and, and we can't say enough good things about all those agencies that responded immediately uh, as things unfolded. Uh, we also notified all of the airline carriers to make sure that uh, Mr. Simpson did not slip onto an airplane. We started receiving many anonymous phone calls. Uh, phone calls coming in identifying potential locations of friends of Mr. Simpson, also locations where uh, he owned property, uh, things that we immediately started working on. We contacted the Border Patrol, uh, clearly one of the major concerns. Uh, the Customs Duty Officer was notified. 
Uh, the all points bulletin on Mr. Cowling's vehicle was uh, put over the uh, radio. Many of you heard that broadcast. Again, we had the Department of Justice all co also contacted us and discussed what was going on at the borders. We contacted the uh, Foreign Prosecution Unit to make sure that we notified the Judicial Police of Mexico. We had uh, immediate support from the FBI. Uh, as a matter of fact, FBI agents responded uh, here to LAPD headquarters and uh, were very instrumental in working with our detectives at Robbery Homicide Division throughout the course of this event. And as you have seen, uh, we also scrambled some additional departmental resources, including uh, Metropolitan Division resources, including our SWAT team. At about 7.15, uh, Detective Tom Lang of Robbery Homicide Division actually made contact with Mr. Simpson in the vehicle as that pursuit continued. I am unable to provide you a list of all of the law enforcement agencies that immediately got involved and worked with the LAPD, but I, I have to tell you the spirit of, of cooperation and support was uh, outstanding. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's something that, that I think all of us can be very proud of, that we have so many agencies that are so quick to respond to assist each other in, in this kind of a situation. I'd like to take a moment to, to also thank the news media. This has been a, a very difficult situation for all of you. Uh, I recognize the competition uh, is incredible. I know the pressure you're under. I know the pressure your bosses are under. I think, uh, as I indicated, these are very difficult times. The judgments are tough. Uh, but we, we felt that we received very good cooperation from the media throughout the course of this. And also all those citizens that came forward. Uh, that was very important. Uh, they provided some assistance to us, things that will help us in the case itself. Let me talk a little bit about what occurred in the pursuit. The Orange County Sheriff's Department uh, was the lead agency in that pursuit from what we can determine and in the conversations that were transpiring between us uh, and, and the officers uh, down in Orange County as the pursuit unfolded. Uh, also, the California Highway Patrol was involved in that pursuit. Uh, we've spoken to Sheriff Brad Gates and certainly thanked him and complimented him for his efforts. That also goes for uh, Chief Ed Gomez. Uh, the cooperation between all of those agencies that were involved in that pursuit uh, was outstanding. And of course, pursuits are very, very uh, problematic situations. There were other agencies involved, too numerous to mention. Uh, we appreciate the assistance of Santa Ana PD. And I, I'm sorry, but I can't tell you the other agencies that were involved. I can tell you they were all very professional, very cooperative. As I indicated during the pursuit, uh, Detective Tom Lang, uh, one of the uh, two detectives in charge of this investigation actually had intermittent conversations with O.J. Simpson in the vehicle. And his role throughout the course of that pursuit was pretty much a crisis negotiator. Uh, as you recognize, there was a, a suicidal uh, threat there. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to uh, be present while this was unfolding, and I can tell you that Detective Lang did an absolutely magnificent job in his conversations and, and clearly, in my view, uh, prevented, uh, prevented anything from escalating during the course of that pursuit. Now, based on the knowledge of the case that detectives had and based on the actions of, of uh, Mr. Cowlings, Mr. Simpson, and the direction of the vehicle, et cetera, uh, the department decided to implement uh, a, a plan that included the the uh, identification of a couple of key locations that we believe Mr. Simpson was headed for. Uh, those two locations we had uh, officers respond where people were evacuated, uh, areas were secured to the best of our ability. I think you saw most of that occurring. Some of you were at uh, his residence or saw what was transpiring there and you saw the efforts of the officers. And again, to the degree that you cooperated in facilitating us clearing that, that area and not providing for more of an opportunity for potential disaster, we appreciate your efforts. When Mr. Simpson returned to, to the residence, at the residence, were Los Angeles Police Department SWAT team officers and they were supported by West LA uh, area personnel. They were prepared to deal with the situation. Now, 
a transition then occurs. Uh, Detective Lang then passes off the crisis negotiation responsibilities to a Metro crisis negotiator, one of our SWAT team members who's trained in this field. And that was Officer Pete Wireeater. He was supported by Officer Greg Wells. Both skilled negotiators, both handled this situation uh, under the direction of Sergeant uh, Mike Albanese, who is this CNT supervisor. The tactical situation continued to unfold. As you saw, the negotiations were obviously well handed, handled. Eventually, Mr. Simpson was taken into custody. How that occurred was as follows. Uh, Cowlings exited the vehicle. You saw him walking around. He eventually walked into the house area and he was taken into custody. He was very problematic, which you saw at the scene. Uh, his agitated state, his activities certainly made the situation worse and it was something that, that the SWAT negotiators had to handle and they successfully neutralized that threat to their efforts. Eventually then, Mr. Simpson was also induced to leave the vehicle and come into the house. He came into the house carrying a, a family picture. Now during the courses of the, of the negotiations, as the negotiator tried to finesse Mr. Simpson into giving up, he asked him if he couldn't come into the house, try to relax, he'd have an opportunity to sit down, call his mother, have something to drink, visit the restroom, etc. Mr. Simpson eventually did come into the house, he was taken into custody, he was searched, and then he was allowed to call his mother, visit the restroom, and had a glass of orange juice. The officers uh, then searched the vehicle and a gun was recovered. I've, I've got to tell you, um, you know, we've had an opportunity to, to hear some of the broadcasts and see what's going on on television. Uh, and I understand there's some second guessing and some speculating. Uh, from my from my perspective, having an opportunity to work with not only the uniformed people that were involved in the culmination of this event and watching these detectives from Robbery Homicide Division, they absolutely did a magnificent job. And I, and I tell you, I personally am proud to be a part of an organization that has such professionals doing the job. I, I indicated before Commander John White and Captain Bill Gartland uh, key people in this operation. Throughout the course of this, it was a very hectic squad room, as you can imagine. As things unfolded, I, I know the media was was uh, going crazy trying to keep up with events. Well, you can imagine what those of us in law enforcement were trying to do, but they did a spectacular job. Again, uh, I just got off the phone with Chief Williams uh, in Philadelphia. He sends his uh, compliments to all of the involved officers for a job well done. Okay, anything else you, you got to add? Okay, we can, we can take a few questions. What kind of gun are you covered, Commander Gascon? I, I can't tell you at this point. I haven't spoken to whoever recovered the weapon. Yes, Gascon. Um, again, it, it would not be our position to be uh, discussing how the prosecution will handle this case. As you know, we have the responsibility to conduct the criminal investigation. It's, it's a very methodical investigation that the homicide detectives uh, conduct. You know, and I, I think what I'll add on this, Pat, is, is we've already seen some of the speculation about why didn't you do this and why didn't you do this sooner. Well, well, let me tell you, you don't know the facts of the case. You don't know the facts of the case, but you will find out as it gets into trial. And the case will unfold before your eyes. And you will see how the pieces came together at what point witnesses came forward and provided crucial information to the department. It's easy to look backwards and second guess. But we can't afford, we can't afford to make a mistake. Lives are on the line, no doubt about it. We are very meticulous in what we do. We're grasping for pieces of information along the way. We're getting cooperation from citizens. As they give us details, we add to the case, we find new facts out, it starts building the case. We can't jump the gun. Well, we we actually called him on the cellular phone, that's correct. And had to call him back several times. Uh, as you know, cell phones in this region go down from time to time, but he also hung up on us 
several times. And of course, there was a busy signal frequently also. I'm sorry, Pete? In your mind, if an arrest had been done a day or two earlier, would you have been able to get all of the information that you now have? Uh, I'm going to make the same comment that the commander has already. We're not going to discuss that. Let, let me let me let me indicate that we are not talking about the evidence itself or how it came together at this point. Okay, we will not compromise the evidence, and we will not compromise the prosecution of this case. Those issues will be addressed by some very capable deputy district attorneys. Yes. Uh, what, could you describe uh, Mr. Simpson's current mental and physical state now that he's here? Well, to the extent that uh, I'm informed on it, he, he is certainly healthy. Um, we've, we're booking him into custody right now. Uh, I, I'll leave you to speculate on how he feels about the circumstances, but uh, uh, Clearly, he was cooperative with the officers once he entered that residence and has been cooperative throughout the aftermath of the arrest. No what yes, were David. doing with the gun? We had heard reports he was holding it to his head as they were driving on the freeway. Yes, I, I, I've heard the same reports. Can you, Have you confirmed, yes, can, can you confirm them? Confirm those reports. Well, we just have what we're yeah, yeah, we're following. We're following what you were doing, and that was part of the invaluable assistance that you provided. Did you make any statements, police, when he was again? Statements would be part of the evidence. We would never comment on what those statements were. Yes, sir. How are you assure this man's physical safety tonight, and why would you take him to the USC psychiatric Well. Because of the uh, support of the Sheriff's Department, we are able to hand both of the suspects over and they will be provided for. Now, we are very concerned about the possibility of Mr. Simpson harming himself. The Sheriff's Department is quite expert in handling arrestees under those circumstances. And the Sheriff's Department will do a fine job. There's no question about that. Yes, uh, Dave, you uh, mentioned a possible criticism looking back on this particular case. Can you tell us what the thought process was and not to keep O.J. Simpson under constant surveillance once you developed sufficient evidence to believe that he was the suspect? What, what, what went into that decision? Well. What occurs in any investigation is you, it's, a, it's a giant puzzle and you're picking up pieces at a time. And as we indicated, uh, you know, it's a major mistake in any investigation to jump to conclusions. Uh, you lose objectivity, you overlook evidence, you go off in wrong directions. Uh, some things appear to be obvious in retrospect to a lot of people, but that's because you don't observation that are close enough to know how the event transpired, how the sequence of events come together. Uh, we think this is an exceptionally well handled. Now, no one came in and said, oh, we ought to change this, and nobody from way up on top ordered that somebody take handcuffs off. Uh, we are dealing with seasoned professional police officers. They responded to a double homicide. It's a horrible crime. We know somebody is, is a murder suspect. We're not sure who it may be. We're not sure about weapons, we're not sure about a lot of things. One thing that we, we allow our officers to try to make sure of is that they get to go home in one piece at end of watch. Mr. Levin. Have you, determined who's, have you determined whose gun that was or where it came from? No, not yet, we have not. Let's see, I, uh, yes sir, you haven't asked. Uh, assuming now that O.J. Is a, is a fugitive suspect of a, of a brutal double murder and he's taking the city on a joyride over the freeways, was he given kid glove treatment as opposed to any other suspect in the same situation? Are you talking about the conduct of the pursuit? Right. I thought the pursuit was exemplary. During the course of a pursuit, we never do anything to jeopardize the motoring public, pedestrians, people that could be potentially in the background, we have to be very cautious, we have to be very responsive. The last thing we want to see happen is that some innocent family is, is killed during a pursuit. These officers that were involved in this pursuit deserve absolute praise. I have time, I'm sorry, did, did you have a question there? Exactly how did you locate the car? I'm sorry? Exactly how did you locate the car containing the pursuit? 
Well, I, you know, I don't even have personal knowledge of that. I know one of the other agencies picked them up first. And by the time we, we hooked up, we were receiving information from you people in the media. Uh, we, we hooked up with the involved agencies from Orange County and the California Highway Patrol. I'm sorry, I, I'm going to take one final question. Mayor, can you please tell us what his state of mind was when he actually walked into the house and was arrested? As I indicated, uh, you know, I can't tell you exactly what his state of mind was. He was cooperative, he was responsive, uh, responsive to the officers, and has been in the aftermath of the arrest. I want to thank you very much again for your cooperation. Have a good evening. What is the arraignment? And that was the Parker Center in Los Angeles as police conclude a press conference now with the arrest of O.J. Simpson. I want to go back to Los Angeles and uh, Greg LeFave is standing by there. Commander Greg. David Gascon, uh, who like many people in Los Angeles today has had a very long day. Uh, he said that both Mr. Simpson and his friend, A.C. Cowlings, are uh, uh, in custody tonight. That his friend, Mr. Cow Mr. Simpson's friend, Mr. Cowlings, will be charged with what is uh, referred to as 32 PC. We'll find the exact language on that, but later on in the press conference, Mr. Uh, Commander, uh, the commander indicated that uh, Mr. Cowlings first uh, behaved in a criminal way by escorting Mr. Simpson away from the house where the surrender had been arranged, according to police, and that Mr. Cowlings was uh, to use... ...between two police officers being transferred from one facility to another. This was a day when many people feared that O.J. Simpson had suicidal intentions. Tonight, he is alive, but not well, charged with two counts of murder. I'll be back in a moment. Oless in games one and two. What about game three? There as soon as possible. No more, no further, just stay right here. Hey! As usual, the police got the upper hand. In a matter of minutes, Simpson's block was sealed off and packed with patrol units and a few ambulances. Anyone who got in the way, like this TV cameraman, was arrested. Some in the crowd chanted OJ's name while police moved into position to surround the house, including this SWAT team member dressed up like a bush, rifle in hand. Simpson's car, after an almost two hour chase, pulled into his estate, providing even more drama. For several minutes, the car sat motionless. Then Simpson's friend, now Kelling, got out of the car. Police eventually took him into custody. Simpson stayed in the car with a gun in his hand, saying he would only come out if certain demands were met. He asked him if he couldn't come into the house, try to relax. He'd have an opportunity to sit down, call his mother, have something to drink, visit the restroom, etc. Little did Simpson know his mother, late in the afternoon, had been rushed to an area hospital in San Francisco reportedly in stable condition. Police agreed to his demands, and when Simpson emerged holding a photo of his family instead of a gun, he was taken into custody. Ironically, what he drank was orange juice. Now, for O.J., a future much like the chase is filled with uncertainty. Greg Lamott, CNN, Los Angeles. In a night Pacific time, the bodies of Nicole Simpson and Ronald Lyle Goldman are found outside Ms. Simpson's Brentwood condominium. Four hours later, O.J. Simpson checks into the hotel near Chicago's airport. He checks out after being contacted by the LAPD and flies back to Los Angeles. Simpson arrives at his home about two miles from the crime scene at 11.30 a.m. Pacific time. 30 minutes later, he is handcuffed by police briefly, uncuffed, and then taken away for three hours questioning. No arrest. Tuesday, June 14, news reports indicate bloodstains found in O.J. Simpson's vehicle and in his driveway match the types discovered at the crime scene. The vehicle and some sneakers are confiscated. Rumors a bloodied glove has been discovered prompt the first denials from Simpson's attorney. I've been told by law enforcement that there was no bloody glove found at Mr. Simpson's residence. He, he hasn't made any statement with regard to, you know I mean? to anything other than he's shocked. And he had nothing to do with this tragedy. Autopsy results indicate the victims died of sharp force injuries. Wednesday, June 15, police sources confirm a match of the bloodstains found at the crime scene and O.J. Simpson's home. Robert Shapiro replaces Weitzman as Simpson's attorney. At the time that this murder took place, 
OJ was at home awaiting to get into a limousine to take him to the airport on a trip that had been planned well in advance for a promotional event in Chicago. Later, police will not confirm reports Simpson is a suspect. Thursday, June 16, responding to a tip, Chicago police scour a field near the hotel where Simpson stayed. A man fitting his description was seen there. The search is for a potential murder weapon. Back in Los Angeles, Simpson attends the funeral of his slain ex-wife with the couple's two children. The family of Ronald Goldman eulogizes him at a separate service. The L.A. District Attorney's Office awaits lab reports needed to seek a warrant for Simpson's arrest. Simpson is expected to be arraigned on two counts of murder on Monday. We're going to recap the O.J. Simpson story in just a few moments, and we'll also be taking your phone calls. The number is right there on your screen, one four zero. Hi. Um, I wanted to say that uh, it is extremely painful to society as a whole to see the public destruction. I would have liked to thought at first that uh, he wasn't responsible for this, but I kind of think now, after looking at all the circumstances involved, I think uh, Mr. Uh, Simpson was basically just afraid that his freedom was uh, about to end. And I think that the, in the letter that he uh, addressed to the public, uh, I think that he was basically saying, look, you know, I'm getting ready all right, to... There's round draft pick of the Buffalo Bills, O.J. became the first man to rush for 2,000 career yards and had a record 273-yard game against the Lions. O.J.'s after-football career also was a major success. He became the chief spokesman for Hertz rent car and also became a movie star, his credits including The Towering Inferno with Steve McQueen. He was also a popular sportscaster for ABC First and then NBC until the events of this past week set him running into a very uncertain future. Rich King, WGN News. OJ had four rushing titles in the NFL, and he was a five-time All-Pro. He finished his career in 1979. A remarkable career, career turns to unimaginable tragedy, hard for anyone to deal with, but perhaps more so for someone who is this famous. Joining us to talk more about this is Dr. Robert Burton, a sports psychiatrist. Jermaine, players 